Thank you. And our next item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 17199 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau, setting out revisions to this week's business. Could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one uh, wishes to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 17199 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now, the next item is topical questions. And the first question is from Liam MacArthur. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on reports that firearms police were deployed to routine incidents that did not require a weapon more than 5,000 times in the last year. Minister Ashton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Police Scotland is a service where the vast majority of officers are not routinely armed. The changes to the deployment model considered by the Scottish Police Authority in December 2017 and introduced last May followed extensive consultation by Police Scotland with a wide range of organisations, including members of the Scottish Parliament's Justice Committee. These changes have allowed armed officers to utilise their core policing skills and attend incidents where speed of response or vulnerability was a key factor. The incidents ref uh, referred to equate to around 0.3% of the total number of incidents Police Scotland officers attend each year. The deployment of armed officers is an operational matter for the Chief Constable and is overseen by the Scottish Police Authority. I spoke today to the Chair of the SPA and was informed that the SPA board members had already planned to consider the first year of the revised deployment at their next board meeting, which is scheduled to take place later on this month. Lee McCarthy. Can I thank the Minister for that response? The Minister referred to the commitment to keep Parliament and the public updated, and this is indeed uh, critical. We all recall Police Scotland adopting a fundamentally different policy in 2013, allowing fires, firearms officers carrying weapons to do all routine duties, having deceived the SPA and not told anyone else. In his evidence to the Justice Committee in January, the Cabinet Secretary said the community impact of the deployment model continues to be assessed. At that point, Police Scotland was considering an independent evaluation by the Scottish Institute of Policing. Has this yet been undertaken and when will it be published? Minister. Um, this has been undertaken and this is part of the substantive papers that will go before the Board for discussion at their next meeting in May. Um, the decision to make the change was done so as um, a sensible use of police time <coughs> in order to um, be able to respond to incidents where speed of response and vulnerability was a key issue. Um, I spoke to the SPA chair, Susan Deacon, this morning, and she um, assured me that this is being done in a proportionate way. And I think it is important to keep in consideration that the Police Scotland um, responds to about 1.8 million incidents per year and so um, the responses that, uh, of incidents that we are discussing right now are just 0.3%. Um, there is obviously a monitoring process that is in place to consider this. Um, Police Scotland um, report to the board um, regularly. They do this on a quarterly basis. And as I mentioned in my uh, um, previous answer, they had already planned to discuss this issue in more detail at the next board meeting. So I think it's important to restate that we are not routinely arming police officers, um, but this is a proportionate approach, which um, a measured use of police resort, and it's obviously subject to the proper oversight. Lee MacArthur. Again, can I thank the Minister for that response and assume that the um, uh, report that is being prepared will indeed be published. Five of the eight legacy forces had the policy of firearm officers storing weapons in the boot of their armed response vehicles and undertaking uh, routine duties unarmed. Weapons were only accessed when firearms were necessary or when the public or police officers were in imminent risk. The SPA refused to include this in its consultation and options back in 2014, only including visible carriage, covert carriage or threat to life deployment. Does the Minister believe the previous model is worthy of further consideration? Minister. I think this is a matter for the police authority that they are and have informed they are keep, keeping under review. Um, they are obviously due to um, substantively look at this issue at their next board meeting and it would obviously be up to them to decide on whether the model, um, uh, whether they wanted to change that model at all. But just to, to reassure the member that we are not routinely arming police officers 
Um, it is just 0.3% of incidents where um, armed response officers would attend, where there is, and there is criteria for that as well, where um, the police officers would be sent out by a tactical um, unit um, to issues where um, speed of response was important. I'm sure the member would appreciate that at times, um, speed of response um, to things like missing persons, to incidents like um, domestic violence, speed of response is um, of the essence. And, but the SPA are keeping this issue under review and Police Scotland do report to them on this on a quarterly basis. Liam Kerr. Thank you, officer. I have to say I have no objection to the nearest officers being able to attend incidents to speed up police response, but does the Minister accept that some of these deployments may have been unnecessary if the SNP hadn't slashed frontline policing? Minister. Uh, I think the member will not be surprised to hear that I do not agree with that analysis. Um, this um, change to deployment model was um, a measured approach to, in order to use capacity appropriately. It is only used in a small number of cases, as I have already said, um, where speed of response is important. And I think the member has just alluded in his question to the fact that he doesn't have an issue with um, the nearest unit of police officers responding to an incident. And I think we would all in the chamber agree that that is appropriate at times in order to keep the community, uh, commu our communities safe. Mr McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. In an earlier answer, the Minister mentioned uh, missing people. Can I ask the Minister how many missing and vulnerable people have been traced or assisted by officers deployed in the armed response vehicles since their roles were extended last year? Minister. Um, according to information provided by Police Scotland, more than 3,500 missing and vulnerable people have been traced or assisted by officers deployed in armed response vehicles since their roles were extended. And these officers have provided also medical assistance at over 600 incidents and dealt with more than 1,000 road traffic matters, including collisions, speeding and drink driving offences. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Minister will be aware there is an obligation placed in Police Scotland to continually assess, risk assess uh, the situation and how they deploy officers. I am sure she will join with me in welcome, welcoming the welcome reduction in firearms related incidents that we heard about last week. Um, will that be reflected in a downturn in the number of officers who are being deployed? Because this Government, on the one hand, says um, that they won't interfere in operational policing, but clearly is giving the green light to more overt arming, including the use of taser. taser. Minister. Um, just to reassure the member, I'm sure he's aware there are over 17,000 police officers in Scotland, um, and the number of armed response police is actually 524. So just to reassure the member that um, it is only a small proportion. I think that equates to about 3% of police officers. Um, I'm sure um, the member will also welcome me in um, seeing the police um, stats this morning that showed that we have over 1,000 police officers um, uh, um, in Scotland since, uh, and that number is up since 2007. So I'm sure the member will welcome that as well. Um, but to reassure the member again, the Police Scotland do report on this issue. They're keeping close, um, they're keeping a close eye on it. That is reported to the Scottish Police Authority, who are reviewing it and who will um, look at this matter in detail at their board meeting in May. Question number two, Monica Lennon. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will agree to a public inquiry into issues relating to the collection of clinical waste and its impact on the NHS. Camera Secretary Jean Freeman. I do not consider a public inquiry necessary given that the government has taken a number of steps to ensure that clinical waste continues to be collected without a negative impact on our NHS. Robust contingency measures were activated on the 7th of December 2018 when healthcare environmental services withdrew collection services from the majority of NHS boards. These arrangements ensure waste is appropriately stored collected and disposed of in line with industry regula regulations and there has been no disruption to NHS services. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. It is disappointing that the Scottish Government is not supporting a full public inquiry. I agree with Professor Hugh Pennington, a leading expert in bacteriology, that a public inquiry should be held in the interests of patients and staff safety, taxpayers' money 
and to protect our NHS from failed private contracts. Doesn't the Cabinet Secretary believe that she has a duty to get to the bottom of this clinical waste scandal so it can never be repeated? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the nature of the clinical waste scandal, as Ms Lennon characterises it, is that a company uh, breached its contractual obligations to our health service in Scotland. Uh, having done that and having failed uh, to take up the opportunity of the additional 20 days to meet those contractual obligations which were part of the contract in which they were afforded, uh, our contingency measures which we had planned for given the difficulties they were experiencing uh, with NHS uh, south of the border were activated. Those contingency measures continue. The framework agreement was in place and was out to tender. That had to be delayed because of the change in market circumstances. A new contractor has been awarded. That new contract is effective from the 1st of April with the usual transitionary period and will take full effect uh, from a date in August. Uh, with all of that in mind, I do not believe that the scandal is either of this government's making, if it is such a thing, uh, or indeed uh, of NHS Scotland's making. And I think all our attention should be focused on that company meeting its obligations, not only uh, to the health service in Scotland, but to its employees. And that is not uh, the right focus uh, to be made towards this government. In terms of what Professor Pennington said, uh, I have a great deal of respect, of course, uh, for his expertise and his knowledge. But actually, when I look at what he said, he said, from what I've heard, now, I prefer to base uh, my actions and my decisions on the basis of evidence and proven evidence, and that's what I'll continue to do. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her further response. Unfortunately, this chamber has heard very little of the evidence, and the Cabinet Secretary will recall at the start of this year, Scottish Labour asked her to pause the procurement process to consider bringing the, the contract back into um, the NHS. Because the private sector, she's right, the private sector has failed. Um, and the Cabinet Secretary herself has previously said this has put the NHS at risk. Now, over the weekend, there have been media reports that contingency plans are costing double what the old contract costed. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can confirm if that's accurate. And given the delays, I hear what she says about the transition period, but we understand that Tredebi um, are a bit behind with the contract. Given these delays and given it will cost £100 million over 10 years, will the Cabinet Secretary give further consideration to bringing the contract back into public hands? Cabinet Secretary. The contract has been awarded. Um, to change that risks this government being held in breach of contract. Now, I'm not prepared to put government at risk in that regard. The contract has been awarded. Uh, I don't know where Ms Lennon gets her information. We've heard that. Uh, but my understanding is that we are on track for Tredebi to take full responsibility for that contract from the date in August that has been agreed. Contingency arrangements, of course, continue and there will be a phased transition between contingency and the new contractor. Uh, and as I said when I made my statement on the 23rd of January, uh, I will come back to this uh, chamber and update them, uh, either through a uh, uh, an inspired question or by other means on the final cost of the contingency arrangements. But as I also said in that statement, contingency arrangements by their very nature cost more. Uh, but the numbers that Ms uh, Lennon is uh, quoting are numbers that I suspect do not take account of the necessary and sensible deduction you would make from the cost of the contingency arrangements did you, and then taking away from that the cost in normal course had uh, has met their contractual obligations, which unfortunately they did not. Alec Neal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary specifically about the 200 tonnes of waste still stored at the company site in Shorts and ask if the liquidation of the company and its associated companies is going to have an adverse impact on the timing of the disposal of that particular waste? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I'm grateful to Mr Neil for that uh, question. The recent uh, SEPA inspections have not identified any significant environmental risk 
and no risk to the well-being of local communities. But SEPA continue to monitor the situation uh, on both sites, both at Shots and at Dundee, on a weekly basis. In terms of the recent liquidation of the company, uh, I'm awaiting further information as to whether or not uh, that allows SEPA uh, to act in a different way from the manner in which it is currently acting. And I'm happy to advise the member uh, of that uh, once I have that additional information. And Graeme Simpson. Um, thank you. Um, we, we, we've had reports of, of waste piling up um, at health centres, of it being uncollected from GP practices. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure us that this is not continuing? And can she say where the waste will be taken when this new contract comes into effect? Cabinet Secretary. So the there uh, have been a number of uh, assertions and reports made. All of them, when they come to my attention, have been investigated. Where there have been uh, difficulties in the early part of the contingency arrangements in December and January, those were resolved. Uh, the uh, cycle of collection uh, follows the cycle in terms of the contingency arrangements, follows the same cycle as uh, was the case in the HES contract. In other words, uh, uh, more uh, clinical waste is of greater risk to the uh, public is collected more frequently than clinical waste, for example, from dental surgeries or wherever. But the, the collection rotation remains exactly on the same cycle as it was under the HES contract. Where there are any further reports, there have been a number uh, of uh, media reports and so on. These are always investigated uh, by my officials and by SEPA. And so far, they've either found to be false or out of date or where they have highlighted uh, discrepancies and uh, mistakes that have been made, they have been corrected. So at this point, uh, the monitoring continues. Uh, there is no risk to uh, the public or to the environment and we continue to keep a close eye on the situation. And as I said to Mr Neil, with respect to the new status in terms of the company's liquidation, uh, when we have additional information on what that may do in terms of SEPA's actions, then I will ensure that members are informed. The uh, transportation of the waste under the uh, Tredebi contract, I would want to be absolutely accurate in my response to the member on that. So if he's content, uh, I will write to him with that detail. I don't have it in front of me. I will happily share that with him uh, later today. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. The next